Did I do that? Yes, I did that. Okay, uh, hi, Devin, and welcome to this weird, intimate online salon I have going on uh, for my widely unattended Instagram. Um, so it is National Poetry Month, and I am struggling to write. And I wanted to use this time to engage with poetry and I wanted to engage with the people who write poetry and I wanted to engage with friends and peers in the community whose work I love and whose approach to craft I admire. And I always wanted to ask them questions after readings that I couldn't. So this is my way of like doing that sneakily. Um, so thank you for doing this. Uh, for everybody watching, I'm just gonna quickly read your bio. Uh, Devin Kelly is the author of In This Quiet Church of Night, I Say Amen, from Civil Coping Mechanisms. He is the winner of a Best of the Net Prize, and his writing has appeared or is forthcoming in Long Reads, The Guardian, Lit Hub, Catapult, Diagram, Red Divider, and more. He lives and teaches high school in New York City, which all things considered is probably one of the greatest professions anybody can have right now. But thank you so much for coming and joining me on Zoom. This is not a thank Zoom. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> but yeah. I, yeah, on this app. Uh, so yeah, I uh, wanted, uh, you know, I will let you start away with a poetry that you'd like to share with everybody and take it away. Sure. Great. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, cool. So this is a new, uh, you were just asking me before this if, if I had been writing and this is like the only thing I've written, I think, in the last um, few weeks. Um, it's called Love in Manhattan. What of all this something has nothing to do with us? What of the ways the kids from college clutch each body to the others after the show and make us feel so old and being old, hopeless, under the last street lamp in Manhattan? And what of the drinks after dinner stop short one or two or a few too soon because we are tired long before we are too tired for conversation? The city is a flock of birds arriving each morning to replace the few from the previous flock who have gone off as dark wings in the dark of before dawn to die alone. Hurried too soon, we feel old. We make names for the children we have yet to have. I think of creatures from another time learning to worship something beyond their bodies. What did they do, those first prayers of prayers? Did they fall to their knees? Did they beat the ground and cry? Did whatever, holding whatever's potential to feel like too much, begin to feel like too much? And did they, not knowing how to feel too much, carry on? There was the night it rained in the park and the two of us caught without an umbrella, continued to walk at the same pace as before, the whole world running past. It was something special, but I wanted more. I wanted someone to break their dampened stride, to turn their head. I wanted to hear them say, you two are so in love, and then leave us alone in it, together, like two dogs forgotten by their masters, each leash caught in the others, as the city boarded itself up and left us its scraps. I wanted that, and isn't wanting, at least here, enough. Wow. Thank you. That, that was Thanks, incredible. Oh, I mean, God, I, the idea of like just even seeing the city uh, in that light uh, as something that is capable of holding bodies and sensations and, uh, you know, touch, you know, when was the last time anybody's touched each other on the street? Uh, and we don't remember. Yeah. And New York is also so is, is such a memoir to love, right? Like we think of like it New is. York as like, yes, finance and tall buildings and money, but also like love in, you know, Harlem and loving in the West Village and loving in like under the bridge in Brooklyn. And there's so much just possibility of love in New York. So thank you for sharing that. I, you know, I wanted to know, I, I don't know if this was written considering everything that's happening right now. 
I don't know how much of that has a say in what you're writing anymore. But we, you and I had a conversation about Lingma's severance. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, we did. when people could meet. Uh, you yeah. and I met and we spoke about it. And it feels almost like but that when you look outside, it, that it is impossible to write without taking stock of how the city has shifted in the last couple of weeks. Um, so when you look at it from as a poet, what narrative possibility do you see from an empty New York City? Yeah, that's a good question. I I, you're, I actually like this, the poem I read existed as like a, a draft of a few lines before I sat down with it. And, and I actually didn't consciously think of the fact that I was, um, that I was writing a love poem to and about love in Manhattan as Manhattan looks and New York City looks like it does right now. Um, but I'd like to think that perhaps some sort of unconscious, there is some sort of unconscious desire to return to that draft of that poem in this moment to explore that now. Um, Cause that makes sense to me. Um, and like, I actually have like, um, I don't really have like a desire to write it's hard. I don't really, I, I, I wasn't sure if I would or I wouldn't, but I don't particularly have a desire to write about, I definitely don't have a desire right now to write about what is happening because I think we're so caught in the narrative of it that to try to make sense of it is, is sort of uh, difficult for me to say the least. Um, but the image of it is so hard to resist. Like I, I, I think about like, Meg and I, for those who watch this, Meg, my partner, my partner in quarantine, um, she and I go for like our, our, our daily sort of sanity walk outside um, for like 30 minutes to an hour with our masks on each day. And it's my favorite part of the day because like it is crazy to experience New York like this. Uh, to be able to walk the other this weekend we walked down Madison Avenue like I live I live on 116th and so we walked down Madison Avenue through down south through Harlem until it became the Upper East Side and then until it became like that sort of very bougie part of the Upper East Side where it's just all like designer retail stores and like you we could have walked in the middle of the street for like a mile and not been hit by a car and to do that on Madison Avenue, like, yeah, it reminds you of Severance. It reminds you of, like, I Am Legend. It, it calls to mind these, like, distinctly, these scenes of, of sheer sort of apocalyptic New York. Um, but then you're like, I'm living it. And it's like, it's that feeling that makes me, sorry, this is such a long-winded answer, but, like, it's, it's that feeling when you catch yourself being like, oh, but I'm living it. And like, you're not, you're not reading about it and you're not watching it. And like, for some reason for me, when I have that feeling that like, it's like, oh shit, I'm living this. And so are so many other people. It's like, I can't write about it yet. Um, it's too, it's, there's too much I'm trying to figure out. And like the image, it's like the image is evolving and um, it's a little, like, it's, yeah, it's like a little too, too fresh or too close to me or too scary. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but it will be fascinating to, you know, um, to see, to see what, you know, I don't know if it's weird to say what art comes out of this, but art will surely come out of it. And like, you know, it'll be interesting to see what that looks like. Um, I mean, it already is, isn't it? I mean, yeah. Um, there's visual art and then there's poetry and there are lines and there was and you know there are tweets i think that yeah. are that are art, show yeah. the beginnings of a poem you know mm -hmm. um that are just sad and sometimes hopeful and sometimes appreciative and sometimes you know mournful like it just every day is there's so there's so much sentiment in a good way not that it's sentimental yeah. but that there's I think there is uh, an awareness of feeling. And by doing, yeah. you know, you are recognizing that we are feeling things and that's, that's that, you know, and that is the most alive we all are. Yeah. 
Um, and I, you know, I, I don't want to fluster you by saying this, but I often read your work and I'm reminded of, and vice versa, I read their work and I'm reminded of you um, and that I feel like there's this so much spiritual association. I hate to use the word spiritual because I'm not spiritual, but I don't know what to use, what word there is to explain this, but some like magical thing binding the work of you and Raymond Carver for me in my head, which because Raymond Carver is again, like is iconic, legendary poet, but I, is a poet I only discovered after I moved to the United States. Like there are many poets who are great that I didn't know of. And yeah. I often noticed that there was, there was this one theme or this one recognition that is so particular to Carver's work that I see in yours, which is just uh, you know, looking at mourning as both a space of new beginning, but as both like as a time of day that awards a kind of light where everything looks different um, and that the rest of the day spoils everything that the early morning gives you. And I remember yeah. at one point you had like the series, I don't know if you still do that, these series of tweets where every morning you'd say, this is oh, what yeah. I out of my window. Uh, and, you know, there was such... But there's also that in your work, right? Like everything is soft and experiential, the streets, the lights, sensations and everything, there's such awareness of being. So I guess my question to you is that, I mean, you navigate in your, at least your poetry navigates this, like this beautiful space of like acknowledging life and acknowledging sentience. Um, as a writer and from a craft perspective, how do you draw these details in your work? Is it that when you begin a poem, uh, you know, with a certain idea in mind, these sensations come to you with physical memory? Or is it that you are very conscious? How, like, how do you compartmentalize these specific details in your work? That's a really good question. Um, and I'm also like, very honored because Raymond Carver is a true hero, poet, writer, hero of mine. And like, um, and and like Raymond Carver was in that handful of writers I read that made me, um, I think I wanted to be a writer before I read him. But like when I read him, I was like, oh, this is how like, it's that person who unlocks the, it's like someone, it's like you're standing at the, the house of wanting to be a writer, but then like you read a few things that unlock the door for you and say like, I can be a writer this way. Like, like I can, this person is speaking about the world and their experience in the way I hope to. Um, and so, you know, um, like I adore his work. And I think, I think what I find in his work and in the work of, of the poets and writers that I really admire is um, is like this sense of um, both wonderment, like being in awe of the world, um, but also like ordinariness. Um, and so like the things that inspire wonder for like a Raymond Carver poem are like going down to the river and it's gleaming and like the sun is hitting it or like he he fishes a trout um i think he has a poem called happiness which is just mm. like this morning i woke and fished a trout and it was gleaming joy and it's, it's like it's something like that it's something so simple um and placid but it's also the one poem right like where there's the image of the two boys and they're like they're not is that the one they're not touching each other but they mm, might yeah. as well have you, you know mm -hmm. they might as well have they're just happy they're newspaper yeah. boys just giving out yeah and it's like a, it's a sense of looking at the world and appreciating each each object each person's ability to both be wonder be wondered about and experience wonder and um and like i i really ascribe to that um in like i don't think anything is not i don't think anything is beneath having a poem written about it. Um, I think I think all objects have the capacity to sort of turn in the right kind of light. Um, like my favorite nonfiction writer is uh, John McPhee, 
mm. who's like a longtime staff writer for the New Yorker and wrote just a bunch of essays about like random shit. Um, but he, he, um, he has a quote where he says like, I am addicted to the earth. Why would I ever leave it? And like, I feel that so hard. Um, like, that like the the very idea of anything I like I I just don't again like I don't I don't think anything is beneath the capacity for wonder which then means like in the act of writing as a craft question like a lot of my a lot of my poems I begin I know this because I wrote them like they begin <laughs> in like very they begin in ordinariness for the most part. Um, they begin like in ordinary scenes or in ordinary moments or in ordinary um, like descriptions of objects or things because like that's that's how I, to me a poem is sort of a blueprint to a feeling. And so like, it's why I have a hard time revising poems because like, I, I think like, I always trust that first instinct that got me to the feeling that called it an ending. And like, and so, um, so yeah, I like, I begin often with like one, two, three, four, five lines of just like ordinary description of like what I see or like what someone said. And, and I, that's like such a nod uh, or like that, you know, like poets like Carver do that and like, James Wright and and Dorian Locks and like um, like they're poets of, of of patience and and like a deep sort of empathy for the way that like anything could could sort of inspire wonder. Mm. I love that. I I hear you on like the idea of first instinct because I have a similar issue with editing poems. I'm very bad yeah. um i can never write poems from with like uh, with a plan of action that today at 5 p.m i'm gonna write a poem it doesn't work it always has to come yeah. from places like being triggered in like a good way not like a bad way but just like being triggered by an image or a sensory feeling and then going with that and then i realized that when i sit down to edit it i'm not feeling the same way um mm -hmm. and so i just trust that for five to ten it's like being high in a way you know in that moment and then i'm not high and then i can't access you know whatever i was doing when i was high in a way that's yeah. I, mean, I can appreciate it i can also see the flaws and the argument but i just don't know how to go back into that yeah um and but you know so would it be fair to say that you you start every like your first instinct to poetry is narrative description like it starts from that and then it it grows and evolves into yeah i i don't know how to write a lyric poem um and i love i love a lyric poem i'm reading a lot of grace paley now and like oh. a lot of her poems a lot of her poems are like six lines long and then they 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 completely shatter me um and but I, I don't know how to do that um and i guess i could try but i don't want to and like um because for me like it it's the story the story matters a lot and and like that's that's why i love like i think two of my favorite poets are carver and and dennis johnson who i guess both are more known for their fiction but like their poems have the kind of um, narrative thrust. They still believe in the story of something. And like, and the story doesn't have to be a whole fleshed out story, but it's still like, there's a path toward the feeling or a path toward the realization or a path toward the resolution. And like, um, I like, I like, that's why I like writing. Like I like getting there. It's like, a, it's, whereas like a lyric poem is often like, an, it's like an argument or like a, um, in this sort of conflict of, of whether it's rhythms or images or things pulling against each other towards some sort of final resolution or toward no resolution. Like the narrative poem is this sort of like, like you were saying, you can sort of justify anything being in the poem because of the the sort of meandering quality of it um i always feel a good narrative poem like a weight and 
and it, it's it's when you finish it that you that you fully realize the weight of mm -hmm. everything you thought was just like some bullshit detail or something you didn't need to know and like you don't realize as you're reading it that those are sort of like things that the poet is putting on the scale and putting on the scale and putting on the scale until you finish and then you're like and then someone gives you the scale to hold and you're like oh fuck <laughs> like that weighs a lot you mean the you mean jesus son dennis johnson right <laughs> it's a very common name i want to make sure no i i yeah. love that because i love this is an argument I have often in my craft classes and that I think Dennis Johnson is like my top 10 favorite writers of all time, uncontested, uh, you know, fiction and poetry, but like to argue for Johnson's merit as a poet, I've, you know, because uh, every time in class you read his fiction and you read, you know, with, you, you've read his nonfiction, but you don't often like, you know, consider enough his poetry and just his like, uh, yeah. contribution to you know narrative work as a poet and just how much patience he has like his fiction is so hurried and so mm -hmm. like you know on steroids almost but his poetry yeah. is so kind and so soft it's it's such a stark difference actually like I and I I feel that with with Carver too it's like the the poem gave him like they're they're not the same um like a Dennis Johnson story, you're right, is like is like getting a, I mean, I, I mean, obviously a lot of his stories are about addiction, but it is like getting a fucking like, it's like a main line of just like pure sort of like unadulterated feeling and conflict, boil, like so much conflict okay. boiled into like this, when it comes to a short story, like this miniature, like Jesus's son is like this, this big and like, um, and then he'll have these poems that sort of meander and mm -hmm. and um, are gentle and um, and which I love. I love that those exist and they actually point, I think, to like the ways in which art is actually like a. When people talk about the difference between genres, it's like that's the same person approaching two different genres. That's the same person with the same feelings and the same view of the world Mm. approaching two very different forms of writing with two very different sort of outcomes um, or approaches. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I thank, thank you for even saying that because as an educator, that gives me an idea. Like I feel like a class needs to study Dennis Johnson in all forms and really yeah. understand how form and genre can shift how you, s not just, just how you approach the written word, not how you see the world. Because there's a lot of beauty yeah. in his fiction too. It's just very economic, um, you know. Because there's yeah. so much adrenaline in his writing, and but I know I was I was just googling some of his poems. There's there's a poem of his that I was trying to find that I think is like so perfect and so different. Do you want to read it for us? Yeah, can I share I think my screen? With the expectation that more people are going to watch this, but yes, yes, please do. Yeah. Um, I love this poem. Um, it's called oh, "Looking yeah. Out." Okay, and like it's it it goes exactly to what you're saying that like this this is this is a poem about being in one place and look and it's called "Looking Out the Window" poem. It's like truly a poem about like about ordinary wonder. Um, "Looking Out the Window" poem. The sounds of traffic die over the back lawn to occur again in the low distance. The voices risen of the neighborhood cannot maintain that pitch and fail briefly. Start up again. Similarly, my breathing rises and falls while I look out the window of apartment number three in this slum, hoping for rage or sorrow. They don't come to me anymore. How can I lament anything? It is all so proper, so much as it should be. Now the nearing cumulus clouds ominous shift. They are like the curtains, billowy, veering at the apex of their intrusion on the room. If I am alive now, it is only to be in all this making all possible. I am glad to be finally a part of such machinery. I was after all not so fond of living. And there comes into me when I see how little I liked being a man, a great joy. Look out our astounding clear windows before evening. It is almost as if the world were blue with some lubricant. It shines so. So, and so it's like, 
that where he says like when i see how little i liked being a man yeah it's like that like and how 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 happy i am to be a to have a part in to be a part in making all this possible like again like that that sense of like that placid sort of like contrasted with jesus's son Mm. which is a car crash of a collection a beautiful like crazy awesome car crash but a car crash nonetheless like that is like a slow rolling meditation which is also like i mean two things right first like he where carver uses the morning as a start of point and the light of the morning in this poem particularly johnson is looking at the evening that also shows how different they are and what times yeah. of the day capture their attention because you know Johnson is more melancholic he's more you know he's almost grieving and the evening is the end of day and the end of you know possibility and there's so much ending with the evening right and then yeah. it's also you see Jesus' son and then you read triumph over the grave which is again like if Jesus' son is like you said a car crash which lasts an entire night and then in the morning you discover the wreck you know the light makes it clear how impactful the wreck is you know triumph over the grave is written you know towards the end of his own life and then you know yeah. in a way it's like he's nearing the evening of his life and he mm -hmm. is he's approaching the short fiction form as he would a poem in a way almost he's kinder yeah. he's using more space he's you know uh, he's also more forgiving he's sadder you know the last paragraph of the short the triumph over the grave short story itself is like probably one of the most heartbreaking blocks of text you know yeah. I, I was on a peter pan bus from new york to providence and i bawled like i was sobbing full like yeah yeah, yeah. it's funny to think of both of uh, those sort of those two authors in conversation because you're right and like i think about like you know it's 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 like a Personally, it's sort of like the uh, like the vague excitement I have of hopefully becoming an old man mm -hmm. is that I can be a a kind and gentle old man and not like a cynical one. Um, because like yeah, like when you read Carver's poems, like especially later, like after he got like a lung removed um, and like was gonna die and had remarried a, a person who actually like who he cared about and like was given a, a, essentially a second lease on life um the way in which he approaches like so many of his of his later poems is with the kind of joy um that is like in stark deference difference to um like what, what we talk about when we talk about love um which is so persistent in its melancholy and it's it's not hopelessness but it's like it's there's a bitterness at its core um that like this is all it amounts to life yeah and and um and but both of them to me are like uh, it's the joy of sort of being able to read someone in their entirety because we can you know um is is like seeing the resurrection of a life and like it doesn't have to happen like dennis johnson didn't have like he had a dennis johnson didn't like think he was going to die and then have a lung removed and then like live for a little bit but like i mean and i'm sure he had a, his moments of trauma but like dennis johnson lived a a full and and a little bit too short life and even in that scope like you see that that remarkable shift toward kindness and like um gentleness um that i hope we all have like anyway yeah at least now at, at the very mm -hmm. least i think it's a good time as any to think of that yeah. and i well, that's such a nice lovely moment to end the recording on i want to thank you for do you have any last words to share uh i have none other than thank you my hair no, thank you uh, for always uh, being so kind and uh, uh, for always regarding poetry with such generous light. Okay, I'm going to stop recording now.